So that's our theme. If you've not been with us uh, through Lent, that's been our theme. One word prayers. Uh, the idea that uh, just a single word spoken with intent, with your heart, uh, can say everything you need to. Now, no way are we trying to limit your prayer life. No way we're not saying it's wrong to pray. Longer prayers, of course it's not, really. The idea is, has really just been to try to, to make uh, prayer a little more accessible, a little less intimidating, uh, a little something that, that we, can, we can incorporate into our life uh, in a more regular, frequent way. And so I just want to go over where we've been. Four words so far. First one, appropriate for the season of Lent, was... Sorry, good, Mimi was paying attention. Sorry, uh, as in confession, God, I am sorry. God, I am sorry. Then we went to please, as in a prayer of faith. God, please, will you do this for me? Knowing that with the mustard seed of faith that God can move a mountain. Uh, then we went to a prayer of lament. We asked a question, why? That sometimes life happens in such a way, sometimes we experience life in such a way that we bring our complaints to God. God, why are you letting this happen? Uh, why are you doing this uh, to me? Uh, and then last week our word was, wow. wow, good, you said it with enthusiasm, wow, as in those moments that just life, uh, you know, takes our breath away, those moments of awe and wonder and worship, wow, God, good job uh, that can just be kind of a spontaneous moment so like i said th those are basic words easy words uh, but they're not going to limit us you, know, you can pray as many words as you want there's lots of other good one word prayers uh, but what do you do and this is where we're going today what do you do when you don't even have one word to pray when when you get to those moments in life where, where even one word just seems like more than you've got. When you've run out of words to say or pray or you're just, you don't have it in you or, or, or maybe you're just speechless. You're just speechless. Maybe life has just been working you overtime and you're exhausted. Maybe you've been hurting for so long that now you've just become numb to the pain. Maybe, maybe so much has happened that you just feel like it's just been dogpiled on top of you and you're overwhelmed. Maybe for you it's, it's more of an emotional thing that, that the words are there but they're just stuck in your throat. You ever have that? Like, I just can't get it out. Or if you're like me, like, you know, maybe you're crying and I, I can't say a word when I'm crying. I, could just, I can't speak and cry at the same time. There's something wrong with me in that. You're just crying too hard to speak. There's no word or maybe you're just sick and tired of being sick and tired maybe maybe you're you're irritated enough with god you don't want to pray you're giving god the silent treatment what do you pray when there are no words to pray well today i want us to look a little bit uh, in the psalm psalm 77 psalm 77 1 through 3 says i cried out to god for help we don't know why. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what he cried. He just, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I, what? He groaned. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. You ever groan? Did you ever know that your groan might be a prayer? I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. Uh, Kelly accuses me of groaning a lot. When I've been sitting in a chair too long, I'm like, Ugh, like getting up. When uh, sometimes it's being from pain, physical pain, sometimes it's emotional pain, sometimes it's always, I, I take that back, every time I get out of bed, I'm sure I, I groan. Uh, sometimes when it's, I got to do something I don't want to do. Sometimes it's when I get a call or a text or an email that I really don't want to get, right? Uh, I, I groan. Maybe, maybe you do too. Listen again, Psalm 77, he, he ended, verse 4, I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated and my spirit grew faint. But then he goes on to kind of tell us what's going on. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. I mean, that's when things were going well. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject me forever? 
Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he, has he in anger withheld his compassion? Remember he said, and I groaned. I just groaned. And so today, uh, as we come to our word for the day, it's really less of a, a word and more of a noise. The word today is, ugh. Ugh. Or maybe it's a, it's a grunt, or maybe it's a sigh, like, you know, and, and maybe it's a different circumstance, like when you're angry, ugh. or maybe when you're just worn out, ugh. I don't want to do that, right? Or maybe it's more of just an emphatic, ugh. right? I don't know what it is for you, it can have different meanings, but it's kind of that, it's that, that grunt, that sigh, that groan that we all do when we're just not good right so you might remember back in the 90s there was that song by cnc music factory things that make you go hmm you may remember yeah this is things that make you go ugh to that now you may be thinking wait a minute didn't we just do lament like why are we back on this lament was why and, and what i said that day is lament is getting up in god's face Remember, lament is, lament is god it's not fair the way you're treating me and i'm angry at you and we're going to talk about it this is, this is not that. This is when I don't have the fight left in me. This is when I, I don't have enough to go after God and I just, my heart's not good, my soul's not good, my body's not good. It's just, ugh. Everybody, let's just do that together on three. One, two, three. Ugh. Yeah, that sounds familiar. It sounds like you've done that before maybe, right? Now you may be thinking, that doesn't sound much like a prayer. Um, but the Bible says something else. We already heard Psalm 77. I groaned. In his time of prayer, he groaned. Well, listen to Romans 8. It's a little more pointed. Verse 26 and following. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The psalmist says, God, where are you? Romans, Paul is saying, when I'm weak, I know that God is there. God's coming to my help. We do not know what we ought to pray for but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through what? Wordless groans. When I, when I don't know what to pray, when I don't have any words left, that groan, that grunt, that sigh, well, that may not be me. It might be the Holy Spirit within me. Because the Spirit, uh, and he, he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Just hear that again. When you don't know what to pray, when you don't have the energy to pray, when, when you're not in the right mental spiritual state to pray, God prays for you. And not only that, God knows what you need to have prayed for. And so when you think, I'm not even praying at all, all I'm doing is going, ugh. That's the Holy Spirit praying for what you need prayed for the most. What do you think of that? Maybe the best prayer we ever pray is, ugh. Every groan, every groan, every sigh. It might be the best prayer because it isn't you praying. It's the Holy Spirit who lives within you doing it for you. Thomas Brooks was a Puritan who said, Though our private desires are ever so confused, though our private requests are ever so broken, though our private groanings are ever so hidden from men, yet God eyes them, records them, and puts them upon the file of heaven and will one day crown them with glorious answers and returns. That's just beautiful. I just finished a book by uh, the Celtic Christian author John O'Donohue who says, you do not have to go away outside to come into real conversation with your soul. Like You don't have to pray out there somewhere. Rather, he says, uh, you don't have to real conversation with soul and with the mysteries of the spiritual world, the eternal is at home within you. That's He's talking about the Spirit who prays within you. And so, so here's what we're trying to say this morning. When, when you don't know what to pray, when you're fed up with God, when, when you're just, it, it's too much for you to come up with some eloquent prayer, the Spirit of God takes over. The Spirit of God within you who knows what you need 
prays the prayer that you can't manage to pray for yourself. Now just listen to these passages of Scripture. Psalm 139, 1 and 2. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Now hold on to that. That's going to matter. Jesus said, your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So this raises a question, I think. Like, if God can read my thoughts, if God is all-knowing, if Jesus is right, and I'll assume He is, that, that God knows what I need before I ask, then why do I pray? Why pray? If God already knows, why do I pray? It's not like when I confess, I'm telling something God wasn't aware of, like, oh, is that right? <laughs> Right? No, he already knew. It's not like when I go to God and say, would you please do this? I really want this. It's not like God was like, oh, I didn't realize that's what you wanted. God already knew. It's not like when I bring my laments, like, why, God, is this happening? That God isn't, oh, I'm surprised that bothers you. No, God, God already knew. So then why would we pray? Kelly and I last week had uh, our uh, 32nd anniversary of our first date on April 4th. Ladies, are you impressed that I knew? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, you should be, yeah. Gentlemen, take note. Yeah, that's important, right? 32nd anniversary, three decades more than we've been together. 29 of marriage this year. Would you, would you be surprised if I told you that we still have conversations that we've been having now for three decades? That there are still things we talk about that we've been talking about now for 30 plus years? Um, and that, by the way, there's no new information to be talked about, and, and neither of us have necessarily changed our minds, but we just, we're still talking about it. Would that surprise you? No, no. And not because we're trying to change each other's minds or convince each other. It's because we like talking to each other. It's because it's how we connect with each other as we have conversation. Kelly also has an identical twin, and they talk every single day. And occasionally I listen on, and I say, you know you talk about the same stuff every single day. She goes, yeah, of course, so what? It's connection, right? Or when your families get together, this happens in our household, and when everybody's together for the holiday and we all start reminiscing, right, about old times, and everybody has a different version of something that once happened, and so we talk about it again, and we all try to convince the other, no, my, my version is the right one, right? Are we really trying to convince? No, we're just, it's connection. I think the same thing is true with God. God. God isn't asking us to pray because God needs information that God would otherwise be in the dark. God wants connection, how badly does God want connection? God, God, God wants connection with you so badly that when you don't know what to pray, God says, okay, I'll do it for you. I put my spirit in you. You don't know what to pray right now? I'll take care of it. I'll just go ahead and groan. <laughs> I'll just take care of that prayer because I want to hear from you. I mean, I think that, ugh, prayer is proof that God wants to be in relationship with us so badly that he'll handle it for us. Joe Saxon's an author I like. She says, though it feels unbearably hard right now, whatever you're going through, I urge you not to walk away from all the progress you've made. She means your spiritual life. I urge you not to look back because God is still here working and moving for you and in you, even though this is difficult terrain. Stay engaged, stay the course, hang in there. I mean, really, sometimes that's all. Spiritual life is just about hanging in. Just hang in there, folks. Just hang in there and let God do the praying if that's all you can do, right? Now, I mentioned earlier that sometimes I can't pray uh, because I'm crying. Right? I mentioned a couple weeks ago in the Y sermon uh, that, that when a friend of mine passed, it was the first time that I had ever moaned when I was crying. Like I, I, could, I could hear moaning happening. Like, what is that? That's me. One of my favorite promises of Scripture comes from Psalm 56, 8. Read it with me. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Every tear you've ever cried, God has record of. Isn't that amazing? In, in biblical times and a number of cultures around the world, in fact, 
They, they had what they called tear bottles or lacrimony bottles, and they would actually collect tears in these bottles. And so they would actually, uh, it, for funerals, they would actually hire professional criers to come, um, and they would collect the tears of these professional criers because they believed there was something cathartic about the tears, and there was something valuable about the tears. And they would sometimes even take these p- tear bottles and, and stopper them up and put them with the body in the tomb um, as a symbol of this is our grief over this loss. This is, this is our pain over you, leave. God. This is the pain we experience now that this person is no longer with us. Um, I, I had a couple that I worked with years ago, and uh, I married them, and they gave me this from my office. And it's to represent every tear that's ever been cried in my office, including my own. And so anytime somebody's in my we do this weird thing. It's like sometimes when somebody comes to my office, uh, it's not unusual that they cry. That happens in my office a lot. And they always go like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do this here. I'm sorry. And I always point to this. I said, no, no, don't be sorry. They're precious. Every tear you cry is precious to God. I mean, what does that say about God? That he understands what we're going through. He keeps track of of our sorrows he records and saves our tears and when we don't know what to pray he groans for us i mean what kind of god is this that is so empathetic so sympathetic so deeply caring for us a god who cares a god who cares i want to take it even a step further not only a god who cares about our groaning but i would argue a savior that groans with us in our groaning because he's grown too. It says in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, this is talking about Jesus. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, that's Jesus, who ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. What a great line. We do not have a Savior. We do not have a God who is unable to empathize with our weakness. Why? Because we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know what that says to me? Is that I don't have to go to God afraid. I don't have to go to God with a stiff upper lip. I don't have to go to God pretending, well, I'm fine. Everything's good. It's all, no. Like, I can go boldly to God in the faith that God will receive me just as I am because His son has been through what I've been through. That my groanings, when when that's all I got for God, that my groanings make sense to God because he's heard his own son groan. So his spirit prays through us and groans to deeper words. Here's another, Isaiah 53, 4-7, a prophecy of Jesus. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. He's talking about the suffering of Christ as he approached the cross. He didn't open his mouth, but is it possible under the weight of his cross as the whips were were lashed across his back, as they nailed him to the cross, is it possible that he he groaned? Jesus empathizes with our weakness because he's been weak. He empathizes with our pain because he's been in pain. He empathizes with our struggles and our doubts because even on the cross, he questioned God, where are you? We don't have a God that's 
not acquainted with our suffering. We have a God that entered deeply into our suffering. He took our pain. He bore our suffering. He took the curse that we deserve. Philip Yancey says, because of Jesus, we have the assurance that whatever disturbs us disturbs God more. Whatever grief we feel, God feels more. Whatever we long for, God longs for more. And I I think I would add, whatever we groan for, He groans for more. In fact, when we groan, it might be Him. And so in this series up to today, I've really been trying to help us kind of understand prayer in a better way. But today, really, I think my point is less about praying a groan and more about understanding who we pray to. I mean, here, think about the God we're praying to. What does it say about the character and heart of God that he stores up our tears? What does it say about the heart and character of God that he knows our sorrows and cares about them? What does it say about the character and nature of God that when we can't pray, he prays for us and groans too deep for words? He cares for us more than we care for ourselves sometimes. That He loved us when we're still unlovable. That He came for us when we didn't necessarily even want Him. That He died for us while we were yet sinners. He prays for us when we can't pray for ourselves. And so we're coming now to, to the end of Lent. We're just two weeks away from Easter Um, We get to Holy Week, of course, that's that final week of his life. You get to Friday, that's the day that he died sacrificially for us. We know he was nailed to the cross. Early in the morning on Friday, he hung there for six hours. Uh, On Good Friday, we'll have a service from noon to three. It represents the final three hours of his life. And there were things that he said during those hours, but we know the final thing as he got to the very end, Mark 15, 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. There's other things he said. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But apparently the last sound that came from Jesus' mouth was a loud cry. What did he cry? Is it possible that as the spirit that was in him left his dying body? Is it possible that the last sound our Savior made before his death was a groan? As he died for our salvation. I don't know what your groan is this morning. I don't know what your grunt is this morning. I don't know what your ugh is this morning. But Scripture says it might be God praying in and through you for what you need the most. What's your groan? Jesus groans with you. Let's pray. And so God, as we approach your altar today to receive symbols of Jesus' sacrifice, bread of affliction to represent his body and, and a cup of redemption to represent his blood, Lord, help us to hear in our spiritual minds and our spiritual conscience, help us to hear the groaning of Jesus on the cross as he gave this for us. Help us as we bring our own groans to your table. Knowing that you meet us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.